Hi folks, this is Glenn Guy, your travel photography guru. Here's a uh, fantastic image from my friend John Milet, and we're going to explore the possibility of adding sepia tone to this image. Sepia tone is an interesting term. Um, back in the day, you would have a black and white photograph, and once that was uh, processed, you would then apply uh, sepia toning to it, and sepia toning is basically a colorization effect that occurs to the black and white image. There were different kinds of, of uh, sepia toner. Uh, probably the most common one was the Kodak one uh, and what would happen was it was a two bath solution. So the first bath would basically strip back um, most of the tonality. You'd literally uh, bleach it back to kind of the bare bones of the image where basically there was just a, a little bit more than a line drawing but that kind of notion where most of the tonality uh, had been removed and you just got back to um, uh, the darkest tones uh, in the image. Uh, as a consequence, you would tend to make the image a little bit darker often to make sure you didn't lose all of your density in the blacks. So once the, uh, most of the tones had been stripped back, you would replace those with colour. So you'd take it out of the bleaching solution and then put it into the toner um, to add colour to the black and white photo. Well, that's not bad because that was just off the top of my head from um, experience many, many, many years ago. Uh, it's a little bit simple these days, of course. So let's look at how we would do it in a program like Lightroom. So it, it's a great picture and it's been well processed. So we don't really need to do anything there. It's just the toning itself. Now, there are many kinds of um, tones. You can make an image cold. You can make it uh, warm. or uh, what's known as split toning, where you uh, may have uh, commonly warmer highlights and cooler shadows. So sepia toning is a warm tone. It could be, you know, reddish. It could be uh, more orange, maybe even slightly reddy brown. It just depends. There are lots of different formulations of sepia toner out there, and the color would, have, uh, would be affected by a number of things other than just a toner in the old days. It's kind of a general term for a very warm image. The colour is applied to the black and white image in Lightroom through, through split toning. So uh, we open it up and we would either de decide to make it a split tone image, warm and cool colours at the same time being added, or in this case we're just going to go for warmth. So it's pretty straightforward. You've got your highlight slider, uh, so that, that would be um, adding colour to the lighter tones of the image. And then the shadow slider, where you're adding colour to the darker tones. So let's try the um, lighter tones first. Now, uh, the hue, hue is basically the name of the colour. So, you know, I could move the hue slider along. The problem is we don't see any effect. And that's because there's no saturation, uh, which in this case means intensity. Um, there's no intensity. Uh, you can even use the word opacity if you're familiar with Photoshop. So, um, we could just move the saturation slider uh, quite a ways along just so we can see the, um, the, the density, the uh, opacity of the color. And now that we can see the color really clearly, uh, it's okay for it to be offensive. We just want to see it first of all. We now move our slider, our hue slider, until we get the color we want. So you see, we're starting with these warmer colors, and then we graduate into the cooler ones and then start moving back again into uh, the warmer, these are sort of magenta colors at the other end of the spectrum. So, um, you know, generally speaking, the sepia, as I say, is sort of a red to um, reddy orange color, but it's, it's just personal preference. So why don't we just try this for a start? I'm gonna make it a little bit yellower. So about 42 is uh, nice. Now, if you wanted to use that exact number and you couldn't get it with the slider, just pop over here to where the numbers are. You could, you could type it in and go enter. Um, okay, now we can adjust that saturation. We can make that particular hue stronger or more subtle. Now, but we'll just leave it about halfway for now. We'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, now, a shadow slider, you could apply the same uh, uh, color, both hue and saturation if you wanted to. Let's do that to start with. So, you know, about 42 for our uh, shadows and uh, about, 
people, say about 50 for our um, saturation for shadows as well. So, you know, that's okay. Well, it looks beautiful, doesn't it? And by the way, this is where we started, the black and white image, and here's the toned black and white. And that might work perfectly well. For me, there's a couple of things. I still like a kind of a split tone effect personally. So I still we're still going to keep this warm. But let's, for instance, make the shadows a redder hue. Um, and we'll leave that sort of yellower hue for the highlights. See the difference? It's kind of pushing shadow and highlight away from each other a little bit because they're somehow different. So, you know, like, oh, I like this color. Each to their own, you know. But we could make it a uh, warmer again, redder again rather. But I kind of like it here at around about 32. Now, uh, uh, so we can move the slider to um, get the hue. But that's not always completely accurate as far as getting an exact number. As I mentioned, you could just click in in that little box and then retype the number. Or otherwise, what you can do is you can just position your mouse next to the uh, little box of the number. And you'll notice, this has come from Photoshop, you'll no notice that there's the hand tool with an uh, arrow pointing left or right. Well, that's now become a scrubby slider, which means you simply click and uh, move gently to the left or to the right. Uh, not moving your body, moving your, your mouse. Uh, and that gives you a little bit more control than actually moving the slider. The slider is moving, but we're not actually positioning ourselves uh, on this point and moving it, we're actually doing it from here. You have a little bit more control. I'm going to go for, for uh, 32. Yeah, so I've got 42 for the highlights, 32 for the shadows. Let's see what the highlights would look like if I move sort of into that sort of yellow green area. I think that actually just separates highlights from shadows that little bit more. So I'm going to go for about 50 for my highlights and 32 for my shadows, but it's completely up to you again what you do with this. Okay, now, before and after. Now, to, to achieve that, you'd simply go to your, we're in the develop module of Lightroom, of course, you'd go to your history and you'd go back to the, uh, it, it happens to be the import stage because I received the image from John already developed. But, Basically, you just click on whatever step was before you started playing with the split toning feature and that, and then um, go up to the very top of the history and click again. But that's a lot of movement, isn't it, uh, with the mouse? So uh, because we're going from the very beginning to the very end in this case, I'm actually going to use the forward slash key, which is the key directly above the return or enter key. The key directly above the return or enter key on the right hand side of your keyboard, easy. And uh, on the top right here, uh, just under the word develop, you know, the develop module, you'll see the word before. If I click the forward slash key again, it doesn't sh say after, but that's where we are, you know, where we've ended up. Click it again, before, click it again, here's our, our finished image. So I think that's quite good and it, it goes through the process pretty well. Just a couple other things. Um, for me, once I do this, I then say to myself, oh, there's a lot of color in this image. And I think in this case, that's fine. But as a general rule, I would dramatically reduce my saturation because for most images, I don't want people to know the photo has been toned. I just want them to feel the emotion associated with that color. Um, and so this is much more subtle before and after. For instance, if I'm going for warm highlights, I want people to get the sense of sunlight without seeing that color. If I'm going for cold shadows, I want them to get the sense of um, coldness without actually seeing that blue aqua purple color that's, that was introduced to the shadows. That's my own personal preference. Uh, but in this case, I actually think uh, a lot of color is good. And because John was inquiring about sepia, you know, um, this doesn't, it's appropriate for this kind of picture because uh, in those days the sepia toning was usually pretty strong. Okay, I think that's pretty good. You know, some might prefer a redder or more orange effect, but I'm just going to go with it. completely up to you what you, um, what color you end up with. It just has to work 
Now, the other thing we can do, though, is we could say, well, we want, for instance, more strength in the shadows. So I could just move my saturation slider further to the right, and you notice the shadows are stronger. Or I could put them back to, say, 50 and uh, make the highlights stronger. We're adding color, but just to one part of the image. Well, that's one way to do it. The other way is just to affect the balance between the two colors. And clearly, that's what this middle balance slide is for. You see, it's dark on the left, which would indicate that's um, pushing the color towards um, uh, shadows, you know, more color in the shadows, or moving it to the right where it's lighter, it's um, um, making the highlight colors stronger. So let's try that. Going to the left, and you'll notice the shadows get stronger. Going to the right, it's the highlights that get stronger. So actually, this effect can help determine where people look in the picture. And you can do it in either of those two ways I've just described, by making one saturation slider stronger than the other, or by changing the balance between left and right. I think the balance key is probably a little bit more subtle, because you're not actually adding more color. Um, you're just changing the strength effectively of uh, highlights versus shadows. So I think that's pretty good. Um, so here's our before and here's our after. And that's basically um, using the split toning feature, feature in Lightroom uh, to create a sepia-like effect. Now, just as a, a final thing, um, and I really don't know whether this image needs it. It doesn't really need any... Um, darkening of the corners to, to bring the eye in towards the middle of the picture because they're like that to begin with, um, just the way the lighting in the room was. But let's just have a look at it. So we go down to effects and this is how I would do vignetting. I'm going to move my slider, my mount slider, all the way to the left. Now I, I know there's a specific um, kind of a localized vignetting tool. But if you look at this image, uh, a, a sort of central vignette where each of the four corners is affected in the same way is completely appropriate. So let's just use the standard um, uh, post crop vignette under effects. Um, I'm going to move my midpoint all the way to the left as well. Now I'm, we're doing this, we're making it super strong so we can see the vignette and control its shape. Once we've got the shape the way we want, we then reduce the amount so it's much more subtle. So as a general rule, the roundness, if you go to the left, it becomes, you know, very squarish. If you go to the right, it becomes very circular. Uh, so as a, most images, I find about 70 works for roundness, but, you know, it just depends. Let's, let's go for about 70. Feather, if we go to the left, it becomes a very sharp cookie cutter effect, which probably works well for one shot in 100,000. Um, by the way, back in the Queen Victoria's day, you'd often get this kind of picture. Yeah, um, but we've moved on since then. So our feather tool, if we go towards the right, instead of getting this sharp edge, the transition between the vignette and the picture, that edge, if you like, is much softer now. And again, I often find 70 looks good. So basically, we've controlled the shape of our vignette, and now what we do is we make it much more subtle. As a general rule, I'm going to be somewhere about 21. Now, I'm just going to go up to the word effects and across to the left, you can see this little white uh, box. That turns the vignette effect off, and if you click it, the white box again, it turns it back on. So it's a before and after, not for the image, but just for this particular panel, the effects panel. So I'll click on it, no vignette, vignette, so I actually think the vignette is helpful for this photo. Um, and normally I would keep it, you know, quite subtle. For this picture, maybe you want to advertise the fact that you've got a vignette. Let me make it really strong again. And let's just take that so it doesn't encroach too far inwards. Let's move that midpoint back to the center. You see, that's what it does. It, it controls the tightness, if you like, of the vignette. So let's give the image a bit more air and move it back to its default 50. Um, and just decide where we want it to be. 
So let's try that 29 a little bit stronger. No vignette, vignette. No, I can't help myself. I like it. I still like it subtle. So I'm going to go 21. No vignette, vignette. But you know, each to their own. And uh, some of you would actually think it probably doesn't need a vignette, but I think it helps. Um, I may even just move the midpoint in a little ways. So that's the basics of uh, split toning and um, just another reminder to folks about how to um, do the basic sort of post crop vignette in Lightroom. So I hope you enjoyed that. This is where we started and this is where we ended up. And um, yeah, see if you're toning with a little vignette on the end. So this is Glenn Guy at the Arcanum. Thanks so much for tuning in and I look forward to sharing more with you guys in an upcoming tutorial video. Thanks and bye for now.